One day, as he saw the crowds gathering, Jesus went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples gathered around him and he began to teach them. In Jesus' longest recorded public sermon, we find the fulfillment of the law and the instructions for living. If you want to know what Jesus was about, this is the place to start. Join us as we study the Sermon on the Mount. How's everybody doing? All right, fantastic. Uh, it's good to have you. Thanks for being here today. If this is your first time with us, we're especially glad that you are here. My name is Kevin. I'm the high school pastor. Thanks for joining us for Crave. Uh, I want to ask you a question, as I often do at the beginning of these talks. When you think of the word fast, what do you think of? Speed, race cars. Did someone say not me? Not eating. Okay, I thought you said not you. Thanks, thanks a lot, Nate. I appreciate that. What else? When you hear the word fast, the flash, anything else? Lightning McQueen, what'd you say? Sonic, the has anybody seen the new Sonic movie? Is it good? It's okay. I'm seeing some thumbs up. All right. That's what I want in a movie. Okay. So I have this bad habit, and probably you know somebody in your life who does this as well. When I hear certain words, it just brings movie or TV quotes to my mind. Is, if that's you, would you just slip a hand up? Okay. So before I even tell you what the quote that comes to my mind is, I just want to tell you, as I've said before, this is a full service ministry. So guys, I think we have a tendency to do this more maybe than ladies, where we, we quote movies or we quote TV shows and we think we're so funny and like, look how smart I am. But let me help you for a second, guys. Let me help you. Ladies, how many of you are so impressed by the movie and TV quotes of all the guys? Look around, boys. Not, not a lot. A few, not a lot, okay? My wife informed me a couple years back, it's just not as cute as you think it is, Kevin. And I went, oh, dang. Uh, but when I hear the word fast, like without fail every single time, it makes me think of a certain quote. Do you know what it is? Anybody? I want to go fast, anybody? Can, I, can we have that image? Maybe it'll bring it to, does anybody know this scene from Talladega Nights? Does anybody want to go fast? I want to go fast. And that's the birth of the whole movie, right? This is not a movie I'm necessarily recommending, but it does have a lot of very quotable lines, like, I'm going to come at you like a what? Spider monkey. Come on, man. I'm going to come at you like a spider monkey, Chip. Anyway, that's a quote from the movie, but this is, when I hear the word fast, I think about Ricky Bobby. I want to go fast. So if you've never seen this movie, you're like, this is the dumbest intro Kevin has ever given, and you're probably right, even if you have seen the movie. But we are going to be talking about fasting today. Some of you gave the very Sunday school answer. I said, when you think about fast, you think, I think about not eating food. Well, correct, that's what we're going to talk about. It's not something you hear taught on very often, not even on main stage in big church, much less at youth group. But here's the thing. When you study through a chapter of the Bible verse by verse, you can't just like swerve around a part that maybe you wouldn't normally talk about. So today we're going to be in Matthew chapter 6. If you're using one of our Bibles, that's on page 775. Go ahead and turn there. Matthew chapter 6. Last week we covered two whole verses. This week, watch out, we're covering three. Ooh, I know, we're getting fancy. Matthew chapter 6, we're going to be looking at verses 16 through 18. So as you're turning there and we're thinking about the biblical definition of, of fasting, like what does that mean, I want to try to put some flesh on these bones for you. And so uh, the definition that I wrote, it, it's a little bit wordy and it's not on the screen, but this is what I put. It's to temporarily, it's to temporarily renounce something, often food, right? But it's to temporarily renounce something good to intensify our expression of the need for something better. I'll try to chop that down. It's 
for a short period of time, setting aside something good in pursuit of something better. You tracking with me? It's not giving up something bad. You should already not be doing that thing. But when we fast, we're going to take something good and we're going to set it aside so we can focus on something better. Now, in the Bible, fasting is always about food, okay? They didn't have Xbox or social media to fast from, as maybe some of you have done in the past, but it's always about food. And fasting is something I don't think we talk about a lot, but it could potentially be a helpful thing for you as you pursue relationship with Jesus. So let's read what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, beginning in Matthew 6, 16. He says this, And when you fast, don't make it obvious, as the hypocrites do, for they try to look miserable and disheveled so that people will admire them for their fasting. I'll tell you the truth, that is the only reward they will ever get. But when you fast, comb your hair and wash your face. Then no one will notice that you are fasting except your Father, who knows what you do in private. And your Father, who sees everything, will reward you. All right, I want to pull out a couple things from this passage. You've got a handout that you picked up in the back. You've got A and B, and then you've got one, two, three. A is this. Fasting is expected. Fasting is expected. As I've already mentioned, we don't talk about fasting a lot, but Jesus expected us to fast. So if you've been tracking with us through this series, and hey, here's the really cool thing, two cool things about this series. If you've missed any given Sunday, you can go on our YouTube channel and you can pick up maybe what you missed. All right, we're recording those, we're putting them up. Uh, you can also, Siri started talking to me. That was weird. It's trying to call Jenny Bowman. <laughs> Jenny, if you're listening to this on YouTube later, I'm so sorry. Um, so you can check out the messages you missed on YouTube. But also, we're just walking through Matthew 6. So if you've missed a single week, you can just go back and read. And if you glance back up in your Bibles now, you can see that we've talked about giving and we've talked about prayer. Robsy talked about giving weeks ago. And if, what you'll notice if you go back to Matthew 6, starting those first four verses, it talks about when you give. Right? There's an expectation of giving. And I think we know that. Like As people who come to church, as people who would say we're pursuing a relationship with Jesus, we know we're supposed to give. And we probably wouldn't push back too much, at least that that's the expectation. Whether we do or not is a whole separate conversation. If you get back up into the part immediately preceding the Lord's Prayer, the disciples' prayer, Jesus says, when you pray, when you pray, pray like this. There's an expectation of prayer. And again, I think all of us in this room would go, yeah, if you're going to pursue a relationship with Jesus, you should pray. But it's the same language that's used here in these three verses. When you fast, when you fast, Jesus says it twice in three verses, there's an expectation that we would do so. Now, do we actually do it? That's the, that's the thing. Now, that's the thing about giving and praying, but we would all agree that we should. But immediately when I start talking about fasting, you're just like, I'm hungry for dinner right now, and I just ate 20 minutes before I came. There's no way I can do this. How could you ask me to do this horrible thing to fast? Jesus surely doesn't want me to fast. Maybe that's for pastors or missionaries. No, no, no. We are expected to fast. Jesus wants us to do this so that we can grow in our relationship with him. The problem is to fast, I think, it costs us something, and it's, it's immediate. So if you give your time or your money, yes, you feel that. But, man, there's nothing in the world like being hungry, right? Anybody in this room hungry right now? Some of y'all clown me because I talk about food a lot. But, listen, I'm always wondering, when's the next meal and what is it? Like, I love food. And I'll be honest, I've, I've attempted to fast, and I have fasted in the past, but it's not something I've done a great job with. Because what I tend to do is just focus on how hungry I am and how mad I am that I'm hungry. But, oh, I'm trying to do this for Jesus. Well, Jesus just wants me to be mad today. No, that's not what's going on. My heart's not in the right place. See, fasting is expected, but it's going to cost you something. And the reality is following Jesus is going to cost you something. If you are sitting here and you say, well, I follow Jesus and I, it's never cost me anything, I'd challenge you to think about, are you really following Jesus or are you just kind of doing this quasi, sort of, I'm a good person, I go to church thing? That's not the same as following Jesus. It's going to cost you. And if all you ever want to do is give to God out of your leftovers, you want to give him scraps, 
I would challenge you again to think about how serious are you about pursuing a relationship with Jesus. Now, fasting is expected, but why do we do it? B on your handout is this, fast for focus. We fast so we can focus. Now, there are a lot of instances in the Bible where people fasted. You can see people fasting before a battle to try to get clarity. You can see people fasting in repentance. Famously, Jonah went and preached against Nineveh, right? And the entire city began to fast, and God spared them. You can see people fasting um, as they're seeking direction. You can see people fast out of grief. There's a lot of people in the Bible who fast. The key is this. Fasting is never about you. Unfortunately, we tend to set ourselves up as the center of our own universe. And we fall into this trap where we want people to maybe see how holy we are, to look at us and, oh, I'm fasting. Look at me. And that's not what Jesus wants from us. If you look at this passage, that's what he's saying. He says, don't make it obvious, as the hypocrites do. He keeps using this term, hypocrites. The hypocrites stand on the corner, and they announce their good deeds. The hypocrites pray so loud with these big, holy prayers on the corners. The hypocrites want you to know they're fasting. Do you know who he's talking about? Who's he talking about? The Pharisees. And now, I think we tend to go, well, the Pharisees are the bad guys. Pharisees were the church people. You get that, right? Like when you're reading through this, the people that Jesus had the harshest rebukes for were the church people who did things in a way that set themselves up as the hero. Look at me, I'm holy. Look at me, I'm... That's not what it's about. Fasting is for focusing on a relationship with God, not about drawing attention to yourself. So if you're sitting at the lunch table and somebody wants to hook you up with some Cheez-Its or some Oreos, no, I'm fasting. Okay, cool for you, bro. That's awesome. More areas for me. Like, It's not about you. Life is not about you. You are not the end result, the end. You're not the point. And sometimes I'm afraid that we get that twisted. Now, Wednesday was something on the church calendar. Does anybody know what Wednesday was? It was Ash Wednesday. Did you see anybody at school maybe who had the smudge on their forehead? Okay, yeah. Ash Wednesday is the beginning of? Lent, right? Any of you ever practice Lent, kind of walk through this? It's not something that a ton of mainline denominations do. So for those of you who don't have any exposure to Lent, let me help you understand. Lent lasts from Ash Wednesday all the way through Easter. And it's a time of turning our attention to the cross. It's a time of turning our attention to what Jesus suffered on our behalf and ultimately on his resurrection at Easter. So Lent really... It's 46 days, but you get to break your fast on the Sunday. So really, it's 40 days, a strong biblical number, 40 days of abstaining from things. And what I often hear is, well, I'm giving up sugar for Lent, right? Like, cool. Like, you're not going to have Cadbury eggs until after Easter when you can get them for half off. Okay, look at you. <laughs> I'm going to fast from soda. Okay, like, that's great. But that's about you. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, if you're just treating fasting or Lent as some kind of, like, quasi-spiritual diet, you're missing the point. Fasting is about focusing on God, setting him as the center of your life, making sure that you are setting aside something that's not necessarily bad, soda or sugar, but focusing on something better, and that's Jesus. So I've got a couple questions I want to ask you. You see you've got one through three there. Number one is this. Who does my life point to? Who does my life point to? If I were to observe you for a day in your life, would I see you building up people around you Letting others kind of step into the spotlight. Would I see you talking about Jesus, the most important relationship in your life? Or would I see you constantly looking for ways to, again, bring yourself to the forefront? Who does your life point to? Again, the, the hypocrites Jesus is talking about here, they're trying to look disheveled. They want to they wanna look pitiful so people will be impressed by how holy they are. But the reality is they're missing the point. They're doing this so that people will praise them. 
and not God. Our lives on this earth are not about us. They're about praising God. And what I'm afraid we do is we go through these religious motions. We'll, we'll make a big show of praying in public or we'll pull out our Bible in the coffee shop so maybe somebody will know. It's not bad that you're doing those things there, but are you pointing to yourself or are you pointing to God? Going through religious motions is not going to help you. There's a passage in Amos. Now, probably not a book that you've spent a ton of time studying, right? Like if you started that read the Bible in a year plan, you often don't make it quite that far, right? Leviticus gets most of us. But in Amos, there's this passage that I find particularly difficult. Uh, We'll put that up on the screen for you. It comes from Amos chapter 5. This is God talking through the prophet Amos. He says, I hate all of your show and pretense, the hypocrisy of your religious festivals and solemn assemblies. I will not accept your burnt offerings and your grain offerings. I won't even notice all of your choice peace offerings. Away with your noisy hymns of praise. I will not listen to the music of your harps. Instead, I want to see a mighty flood of justice, an endless river of righteous living. This is God saying, when you're just going through the motions to go through the motions, that doesn't impress me. That's not what I want in your life. I don't want you just to put on a show so that you can impress your parents or the cute boy or girl in youth group or your pastor or your small group leader. I don't want that. He says, I won't accept your offerings. I'm not going to bless what you're doing. Jesus in the New Testament speaking prophetically into the future, talks about people who will one day stand before God and say, I did all these church things for you. And Jesus says, yeah, you did all those things, but they were never about me. I don't know you away from me into a place of darkness. I would look at this passage if I were you, and I would begin to ask some questions. Am I just doing what I'm doing with this whole church Christianity thing because I want to look good and I want people to see me and notice me? Or am I doing what I'm doing to pursue a relationship with Jesus and point others to him? Everything we do should be about God's glory. In fact, Paul says that in 1 Corinthians 10, 31. We'll put that on the screen. Whether you eat or whether you drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. And that actually kind of comes back to fasting. Whether you fast from food or whether you don't, you do it for the glory of God. Your life is not about you. Who does your life point to? Question two, who do I live my life for? Bless you there in the back. Question two is, who do I live my life for? Now, this may seem similar to the first question, but it is different. Are you living for the praise of your peers? Are you looking to impress the people around you? Or are you more concerned with pleasing God with the things you say and the things that you do. If you spend your life chasing the approval of your peers, everybody look right here at me, you will never be satisfied. You just won't. There will always be somebody that what you do will never be good enough for them. That might be somebody very close to you. Some of us are chasing the approval of family or close friends, and it hurts that we can never seem to measure up. And you'll spend your whole life chasing that, even after they're dead and gone. And I just want you to hear me say now at 15, 16 years old, stop chasing their approval. That's not who you live for. Your life should be lived to glorify God. Paul understood that. In Galatians 1, he said, obviously, I'm not trying to win the approval of people, but of God. If pleasing people were my goal, I would never or would not be Christ's servant. You can't live your life to make everybody happy. You just can't because you'll never succeed. It's not about making people happy with you. I'm not saying go out of here and be a jerk. I'm not saying go out of here and be obstinate and just try to beat people over the head with the Bible. Don't do that. What I am saying is you live your life to glorify God, whether people are watching you or whether you're by yourself. Choosing to do the right thing when no one is watching, that's integrity. And that's hard. And if I'm honest, I think it's in short supply in 2020. People who will do the right thing even when no one else is around to praise them, even when no one's around to bust them, still choose to do the right thing. 
Colossians 3.23 kind of comes back to that similar thought that we also just looked at. It says, work willingly at whatever you do as though you are working for the Lord rather than for people. See, ultimately, we're serving God no matter what we do. One day, you're going to graduate high school, and then probably college, if not straight into the career force. And whatever you wind up doing with your life, whether you're a veterinarian or a plumber or an engineer or a stay-at-home parent, whatever you do is not about that thing. It's just not. God is looking for you to glorify him in what you do. Every single person in this room has been uniquely gifted to do something with your life, something that the person beside you probably can't do. And even if they have similar giftings, they can't do it the way that you can. And you should do that for God because your life is about Him. And you should be living to make Him happy. At the end, you're not going to stand before your mama or your daddy or your grandma or your grandpa or me or your small group leader. In the end, you're going to stand before God. And I don't say that to scare you, but that's something that you should think about. Like one day... All of us in this room, everybody at Brookwood, Pastor Perry has to stand before Jesus. I have to stand before Jesus. You have to stand before him. And if that gives you some fear and some trepidation, you're like, man, I just don't know. Don't wait and try to cram like you do for some of your exams. Like some of y'all know you have a test tomorrow in fourth period. You're going to start studying in like third period. You know what I mean? You're like, yeah, that's me. Um, don't treat life that way. Don't push this Jesus thing off and you're like, you know what, maybe when I'm older and I've kind of had my fun, I'll start you know, trying to cram the Bible like I'm studying for a final exam so I can stand before Jesus. Don't do that. You're going to miss out on what God wants to bless you with now. Living your life for him. Final question I'll ask you tonight is this. How can I better focus on God? How can I better focus on God? If you're sitting here and you're a Christ follower, then you want to focus on God better in your life. You just do. You cannot become satisfied with the status quo. You can't go, you know what? I've made it. This is it. I, I can't do any better than I'm doing right now, so I'm going to just coast till the end. Don't do that. All of us in this room have room for growth Every one of us can take steps to pursue a relationship with Jesus a little more passionately today than maybe we did yesterday. And the reality is, a life lived for Jesus is not a straight line that goes up always. You guys know it's more of a roller coaster, up and down, up and down. Three steps forward, six steps back. Five steps forward, 15 steps back. But wherever you are in your walk with Christ, there's always room for growth. So how can you better focus on your relationship with God? I would submit to you, as we're at the first Sunday in Lent, as we're sitting here talking about fasting, that maybe it's fasting. And perhaps mentally, again, you push back and go, I don't want to do that. Like, I don't want to give up food. Kevin's trying to starve me. No. I'm not saying you have to eat nothing. There are different types of fasting. Some people eat before the sun rises, and then they don't eat again until the sun goes down. Some people will do, like, fruit smoothies. You can do a lot of different things. And if you're sitting here going, there's no way this could help me, have you tried it? Like, have you tried it? Jesus says we should fast. And you're sitting here going, well, I want to have a better relationship with God. I want to focus on him more. Have you tried this thing that God said we should do? It can be uncomfortable. It's going to hit 1030 and you're going to want to bite somebody's head off because at least you'd have something to chew on. Like you're hungry, right? Fasting can be hard. But following Jesus, nobody ever said it would be easy. Fasting is something that I think a lot of us have not tried. And maybe we're scared to try it because we just don't think we could do it. I'm bad about this. If I don't think I'm going to be good at something, I just won't try it because I would rather just not try it than try it and fail. And if that's your mentality with this, let me, just, let me just challenge you. Push through and try it. Try it for one day. And you don't need to go on social media and be like, I'm doing it. Today's the day I'm going to fast. No, 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 no. Just do it. Just try it. It's not a big public thing. You're not looking for somebody to praise you. Again, Jesus has been consistent throughout this. The privacy 
of going away and praying, the privacy of not letting your left hand know what your right hand is doing, the privacy of fasting in a way that doesn't draw attention to you, but God who sees everything will reward you. What does that reward look like? I don't know. I don't know what that could look like in your life, but I know that God wants you to fast at some point. Now, maybe you've got some medical things, dietary things. You're like, I just, I can't, I can't not eat. Okay? Biblically, the only fasting we see is food. But there are other things that we can fast from. And again, it's not giving up something bad. Like, let me just use a very common real-life example, okay? It may get a little tense for a second, but you can handle it. If you're vaping, okay, if you're here and you're vaping, you should stop vaping, okay? Don't be like, I'm going to fast from, from vaping. Just stop vaping. Like, don't do that. I'm spitting everywhere up here because I'm so passionate about this. It gets dumb. You're not like, don't set that aside for the glory of God for 40 days. No, just stop. Stop. Everybody say it with me. Stop, okay? This is setting aside something good to focus on something better. Setting aside something bad is called repentance, okay? Now, that's something we should practice, but don't try to dress it up as something more than it is, okay? And it's easy to laugh about vaping if you don't vape, but we all have stuff in our life we know we shouldn't be doing, and if that's what you've got going on, repent, set that aside, okay? Fasting is setting aside something good to focus on something better. Maybe that's your screen time. Maybe that hits a little close to home for you. What if instead of sitting down to episode after episode after episode on Netflix or Hulu or HBO, you sat down and actually read your Bible? Like, it's crazy. If I subtract this thing and add some Jesus in, it's almost like my walk with him might get stronger. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. But it's not enough, hear me, it's not enough just to set aside something and then do nothing with it. Right? So if you go to tomorrow, you're like, I'm convicted. I'm going to fast cool, and then you just like don't eat tomorrow, and at the end of the day, you're just angry, and you're like, this is stupid. Kevin's the worst youth pastor I've ever met in my life. I'm going to fight him when I see him. I'm so hungry. You didn't try to replace that good thing with something better. So maybe instead of eating, you take that time to pray. Dear God, please help me not to murder anybody today. I'm so hungry. God, help me to focus on you. We, it's not enough just to set something aside. We want to pick something up. Are you tracking with me? Does this make sense to you? Paul talks about this, not in the terms of fasting, but in Ephesians 4. We'll put that up for you. He says, if you're a thief, quit stealing. Okay, that's, that was repentance, right? It's, it's, duh, stop doing this bad thing. But don't miss what he says next. Instead, use your hands for good hard work and then give generously to others in need. So there's this theme of stop doing this other thing or set aside even something good and turn to something that's better. He goes on, he says, don't use foul or abusive language, okay? Cool, again, we know that we shouldn't be doing that. We're taking that out. Instead, let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. So when we cast aside sin, we want to pick up some healthy spiritual habits. When we set aside something good for a temporary period of time, we want to focus on something better, now, I'm not telling you go out and fast from everything indefinitely. If you're like, I'm just... I'm going to take a stand and fast from water. You're going to die in three days, okay? You have to drink water at some point, okay? You do. You do. It's science, okay? And I'm not trying to set up science versus Christianity. That's not what I'm doing here, okay? But we can set aside something good for a temporary time to focus on something better. Now, I skipped this verse in my notes earlier because I actually want to end with it. James 4, 8 says this. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. This version says, come close to God, and God will come close to you. It's possible that you're sitting here, and maybe you've laughed at some of this, and maybe you're like, you know, fasting is just not for me. I don't, I don't know what is, but this isn't it. I just want to leave you with this verse and tell you that if you will honestly pursue Jesus, if you will be open to what he wants to do. Even if maybe it doesn't make 100% sense, you're like, I have never gone more than three hours without eating in my life. Start there. Take whatever step that God gives to you, but take a step towards him. And what this verse promises, as we do that, he's not going to like back up. He's not going to play hide and seek. If you take a step towards him, he's going to take a step towards you. Maybe that's fasting for you. 
try it. What, what do you have to lose? Maybe it's not fasting. Maybe your step is something else. But I, I challenge you to pray and ask God, God, what do you want me to do that will help me focus on you, that will make you the center of my life and not so much myself? Okay? I'm going to pray for us, and we're going to go to a small group and talk about it. God, thanks for today. Thank you for this promise of James 4, 8, that if we take a step towards you, God, you'll take a step towards us. The reality is, God, you've not moved. We're the ones who run off and we do our own thing and we focus on ourselves. And we get so caught up in the pursuit of praise from our peers or our parents. God, we, we want to live a life that glorifies you. And so I pray that you would reveal to every person in this room, whether they've been following you for 20 plus years, God, whether they have no idea whether they even believe that you're really there, would you show each of us the next step we can take? And God, I pray that you would give some in this room courage to fast, to try this spiritual discipline that maybe we've never done before. Give us strength, help us to focus on you and do this not to glorify ourselves, but to focus on you and draw near to you. So we love you. Bless our conversation now as we go to small group. In Christ's name, amen.